one of you ever seen. Best. George Best at his brilliant best. He was just magic, and people had to go to see him. George Best! He was the best player in the world at the time. George had it all. And best has taken his shoe off. He played out with his stocking feet. He was uh, a magician, a wizard. Best! With that cheekiest of all cheeky little flicks by this supreme cheeky chappy, George Best. You talk about genius or art or whatever you want to call it. Certain people, some people are born with it. Muhammad Ali had it, you know. <laughs> Even horses have it. Red Rum had it. Desert Orchid had it, you know. Tiger Woods has got it. Uh, Jack Nicholas had it. It's, uh, and they're the lucky ones that don't really have to work too hard on it. And uh, I just, I do the same as they all did. I, I enjoyed what I was doing. I loved it. George Best's love affair with the football began here. Manchester United's first and greatest star rose in East Belfast, on the Craigie Road estate, on the football pitch at the top of Burren Way. The first born to Dick and Anne Best of that parish was a boy, a footballer. It was always football. From first thing in the morning to last thing at night, that's all I did. I got up, I had breakfast, the way to school, I, I kicked the ball all the way to school and all the way back at lunchtime and all the way back for <laughs> after lunch. And as soon as I finished school, I was at the, the top of the street playing. Piece of grass that we used to kick a ball around is still there. Yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, that was our, that was our haven. And uh, to have, uh, actually have grass on it was a bonus. <laughs> well, I had him from about six years old, kicking him with both feet in the garden path there. He said he couldn't do it, but I showed him that he could do it. Showed him and step and step and then told him how to do it. I said, you have to be a football, that's what you got to do. There were games where I used just one foot on purpose, you know, trying to get through 90 minutes without using my right foot. And, uh, and it was like sitting in yourself tests all the time. United scout Bob Bishop knew what he'd seen. He sent a telegram to Matt Busby. It read, I found a genius. Bob Bishop was scared for mine that he had just got the job. And he was looking for likely kids, and he uh, recommended George. The only thing I worried about was my size, obviously, because I was so small and, and thin. But, uh, but even that, they connived. They, they arranged a game against a, a team of older lads to see how I handled it, and I uh, came through it, and so they were, was convinced them. I went over with a lad called Eric McMorty, and they told us what to do, you know, get off the boat and get in a taxi go to the station, get a train to Manchester, and then when we got here, get in another taxi, you go to Old Trafford, and, and that was it. I should probably know the story, only stayed a day and a half, him and Eric McMurray. And... Neither of us had been away from home, so we decided it wasn't for us, and came home. A couple of weeks after that, I wrote to his father, Dick Best, and said that I could understand a boy being home sick, but if George ever showed signs that he'd like to come back, they'd be delighted to have him. It was just a matter of uh, my dad and the club sorting out arrangements again. So he asked me if I would write a letter for him. So I wrote the letter. So that's the start of the George Best story. Champagne was not on the menu to begin with, not in Acliffe Avenue, Chalton, George's first digs. His first landlady became his first lady. Mrs. Fulloway was, a, oh, yeah, she was wonderful. She became my, my second mum, looked after me and... Uh, tried to protect me as much as she could, and uh, she, she was wonderful. She looked after us great. Um, she became our, our sort of Manchester mother. She had this lovely, wonderful, frustrating habit of waking me up by creeping up on me in the morning and rubbing my nose, which really, I wanted to strangle her, but... <laughs> George could talk around, uh, he was a very engaging guy. He was certainly a bit of a favorite of hers, and, and, and George could sort of do things that I would perhaps not, not dream of trying to do. She gave me my own key after when I was 17, as a sort of present. She said she thought I was grown up enough to have my own key, which I wasn't supposed to have. So instead of coming home at 10.30, I could stay out until 11 o'clock or 11.15. That was the next morning, though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If I was lucky, yeah. 
When we were sat around in the digs, we'd have a game of cards. You know, nothing really untoward. There's a group of us together, all lads the same age. It was more a group thing then, you know, you didn't notice George. The only place you noticed George really was on the field, I think. He was exceptional, to say the least. Some of the stuff he did in training was so good, you thought that it couldn't possibly be reproduced in the football field. I remember being in the first team, and Wilf McGuinness told me one day, you've got this great little player that's come from Belfast, um, George Best. He says uh, he's going he's to be a great player, no question. You knew he had it. You knew he had the, the quality. He was the only player I ever knew who, if you played two-touch football, you're not allowed two touches, could beat three people and score a goal. I thought, I'll stop this. So we started playing one touch. You're only allowed one touch so that other players could get more of the ball. And what George was doing as it came, he'd knock it against the opposition, get it back, knock it against another of the opponents, get it back. And he could do this. This was the quality he had. He was exceptional. I remember his debut against West Brom, I think it was Graham Williams was played left back. And I met Graham Williams on holiday that year in Mallorca, and he was talking about it, Graham. She said, I'm playing against this unknown kid, he said, I'll just give him a couple of kicks and that'll be the end of it. He said, I tried to kick him all afternoon, he said, I never get near him. He said, I kept kicking fresh air all the time. He said, he was unbelievable. I just went out and enjoyed it, and I just did the same as I did when I was a kid in the streets or in school or in the youth team. I just went out and kicked the ball around. That's, that's what I enjoyed doing. I mean, to have your own boots in the boot room, that was the, that was the big step. You'd arrived. You'd arrived. Someone else cleaned your boots for you. Which player were you most in all of? Bobby was the one. Bobby was the superstar. And then, of course, uh, Dennis had arrived from Torino. And Harry Gregg, of course, he, he was a big star to everyone in Northern Ireland. You know, having gone through the, the Munich crash, and of course the boss, I mean, you walked the other side of the corridor if you had to pass him in the corridor. Busby had a new babe, his team sheet had a new name. He was just 17, still to win the FA Youth Cup with United, but already a first team regular. He was simply irresistible. Charlton, Charlton to best. Third and Law in the middle, Charlton lurking on the penalty area. There's Law, and it's 3-0! Beautiful goal by Law. And Manchester United just carving this Arsenal team apart. Benetti for Chelsea. To McCready. Best. With McCready, and McCready's made a catch. And it's a magnificent goal! Here we are on the last Saturday of the Football League season and still any one of three teams can win the First Division Championship. But we feel that this is the game, Manchester United and Liverpool. Charlton making it with supreme accuracy to Canelli. Which again, Law, that's it. Charlton now to Canelli. And the the second half, just like the first half, with Manchester United doing all the attacking. Creran and Lord with the two. Just champion. Creran. George finished his first full season with United on top of the first division table. Canelli. He was already top of the pops with his rapidly expanding band of admirers. The girls were certainly looking at him. I mean, you know, young lads. I mean, what, what would you expect? We, of course, we were eyeing the girls up. Every day was like a, a party. If your best pal nicked your girlfriend, that was par for the course. That's where it was. Oh, yeah, I think he got mobbed all the time everywhere they went. It was all good, good clean fun, and that's the way we looked at it, and that's, that's the way we treated it, which is the way it should be. An official fan club tried to form an orderly queue, but everybody wanted a piece of the action map. It was just like um, a pop star. He came to play football, and he wasn't like any other footballer that we, we'd seen. So we thought, oh, it's a bit, um, a bit of all right. <laughs> Let's start a fan club for him. We got his phone number and we rang him. And it was the case of, <gasps> you, you, talk, you talk, you talk, you <laughs> talk. And um, it was just a case, really, of saying, is it OK if we start a fan club for you? And he just sort of said, well, Yes, I suppose so. And that was it. We'd got his blessing and we went ahead with it. Fair and forward to best. Oh, he's going to get number five, yes! 
beautiful football by the young outside right, George Best, the boy with the beetle haircut. Oh, how these players can stand this is beyond me. And here come United. It's Best, is he going to get it? Yes! It's this fabulous stuff. Those boots were made for shooting as well as walking with him. But it was in Europe where George made his great breakthrough. Busby's Holy Grail, the European Cup, and a quarter-final against Benfica during which a legend was born. United won the home leg 3-2. Surely not enough of a lead to take to Lisbon, though. The one game I, I think that we almost reached perfection of such a thing was in 66 when we beat Benfica in the second leg in Portugal. And I scored twice in the first 12 minutes. And we ended up beating a team that were virtually unbeatable at home. We, we beat them 5-1. Here comes Best again. What a player this boy is. He's got another. What a player. This is Law. To head. And it's Canelli. It's another one. This is going to be a rout. That's how it's turned out, and here comes Dreran to get number four, yes. And Dreran just streaking down. Come. Comes the Manchester United jigsaw once again, Canelli. A lovely one to Charlton, this will be in number five, I should think. Oh, what a goal by Bobby Charlton. What a superb goal. That is the pink ribbon on this luscious box of chocolates that Manchester United have given us tonight. And Manchester United going to get number six. It's best. No calling for it. On the right, with that cheekiest of all cheeky little flicks by this supreme cheeky chappy, George Best. Is that the greatest game you ever played for United? I would say that was because he displayed a tremendous skill that night uh, against very skillful players. One of my proudest moments I had was the night when we scored the two goals against Benfica and Benfica. And I was on nights and I'd take my little radio on, to listen to it on the radio, the conference. And this boy, this boy, best, he said, he's a wonder player. He said, he has scored two magnificent goals in the first seven minutes. It was absolutely incredible in the game, but that was one of the many, many incredible games he played. But that was just the start of something because it was on television and the whole of Europe had seen it. The new arrival had already been christened. El Beetle, they held him in Portugal. The cap fitted perfectly. But that was the start of the Beetle thing. You know, I was the same as all kids. I, you know, I loved the Beatles, you know, the music and I wore the, the jacket and I had long hair. So, uh, and, I, and every newspaper in, in, in Europe uh, had the same sort of headline, uh, El Beetle. What happened was quite unique. It was just a coincidence that one of the best players Britain's ever produced grew up at a time in the 60s when the youth culture was starting to explode in this country. At that particular time, what was happening with the Beatles and, and everything else, you know, the Rolling Stones, uh, Outrageous was in. Young men in, a, in a, um, a bubbling city, Manchester was a good place to be. And George was in, in, the, in the, just at that particular time, and it was perfect for him. If you'd been a Beatle, which one would you be? Um, probably John Lennon. I'd have been the uh, I'd have been one that could shot, probably. <laughs> I'd have been a controversial one, probably. <laughs> Baby, you can drive my car. Best was already a star. 19 and his name above the door of his first boutique. Gorgeous George was selling like hot pants. The shops were just a hobby. I'd always been interested in clothes, and, and every time the fashion changed, I tried to change with it. And yeah. It's a nightmare looking back when you see some of the stuff we used to wear. Of course, the cowboy boots and the winkle pickers and all sorts of stuff. I remember going in and thinking, I... I wouldn't have these things on the curtains, either with that bright. Did any of your uh, teammates ever come and shop? <laughs> no, they were all a bit older than me, so they uh, they weren't quite into the, uh, the flared trousers and the uh, tie-and-dye shirts. 
Oh, no, I didn't dress the same way as dress. I was married with kids, for God's sake. I mean, I wasn't a trendy. I mean, they were horrendous when you see them today, but we all thought we were quite hip at the time. George bucked every trend, choosing Manchester City's Mike Summerby as his business partner and running mate. You were single. You know, Manchester was exciting. All the girls were beautiful. They all spoke to you. You know, with a f it was nice. It was just a nice atmosphere, you know. We were both single when we met. Uh, both around about the same age and uh, went to the same clubs in Manchester. We always used to start off at the really top class places and then we used to end up in the Doss houses. We used to start off at Dino and then we used to go to Mr Smith's and we used to drift onto the Garden of Eden. Phonograph we used to go to. If we could get in, it was a very difficult place to get in. And we used to go to the uh, Auto Club and went back to the Piccadilly Club because George used to like to play a game of 21s, you know. And we used to just drift off then back to into Moss Side to Phyllis's, which was like a, a very high class Shabin, you know. I mean, George Best, as my wife said, he was a very beautiful man, and he, he was a beautiful man. You know, women always go for looks straight away. With me, I sort of, I grow on people, you know, but there was always a few hanging around when he made a decision to dis what was going to happen. There was always a few for me to go at, you see. I would say they're definitely the English girls are the best looking. I prefer them to have uh, long legs. It's going to have to be really, really something. Britain's most eligible bachelor was fast becoming Britain's most elegant footballer. Impossible to tame on or off the field. Now you see him, now you don't. He played his football as he lived his life, and in the same class of company. Corner two. Manchester United being taken by number 10, Heard. Has to watch for Law. It's a goal by Law. Oh, is he going to get it? Yes, it looks like it. A great save by Jennings. Perrin, the best. Oh, God, that's law. Oh. United's dream team won another title in 1967, and with fantasy football, a 6-1 win at West Ham to clinch it. But that was just for starters. Best and the others knew that they still owed the boss one. To me, he was the boss. He was the best, not only as a manager, but as a person. We talked about genius. I think he was a genius at what he did. It takes a special man to be a special manager. Do you still hear his words of wisdom? Yeah. Mm. The one thing that's always stuck in my mind is that he always said, go out and enjoy it. The greatest performance of all time by George Best was here in Belfast for Northern Ireland against uh, Scotland at Windsor Park. I just had one of those games, everything went right. I could have scored three or four you know, with the chances. Best. Oh, a great shot. Well, Best is really rattling them in. He's the one danger man, but what a save by Simpson. He took the Scots apart himself. I mean, he was magic. I mean, he was mesmeric in everything he did. He had such control. He was so he had pace. He had strength. Well, certainly, Best is the most dynamic marksman on the pitch today. Dillman, Russell. to Best. And here comes Best. And he still manages to get that shot in. How on earth he does it. And Best. Oh, beautiful football. This man is a genius. What a player. And how the crowd love him. From a national point of view, it was the best game I played, and they, they still, the fans still talk about it here, you know, which is, which is nice. Ferrand. Burns making a run. Now Heard. Good dummy, has Best up in front of him. This is Best. Wriggling out space. What a fine set! What a fine shot! Georgie Best! Charlton, really bad one by Yates. Best trying to break quickly. The best is clear. There's a real chance here for Best. No doubt we'll have another 
another superb performance from the new footballer of the year, number seven, the great George Best. And Tan. Uh, and Tan. Styles. Best again. Good flick, that was my best. This is Aston. Again, the queue at the far post for the cross if he can get it back. Ran well for him. Best! So Manchester United were in the European Cup semi-finals for the second time in three years. This time it was Real Madrid in the Bernabeu. United recovered from 2-0 down and 3-1 down at half-time when Busby delivered some of his most carefully chosen words. Fate was beckoning the master and his sorcerer of an apprentice. Billy Fawkes, of all people, scored the decisive equaliser. Wembley was waiting. The club's destiny was ready to be delivered. And George's finest moment along with it. What about the final, George? What do you think is going to happen there? Uh, you mean the money everybody win by? <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous day, a gorgeous evening. And the cameramen all lined up, waiting for these two great teams to make their appearance. The fact that it was at Wembley you know, it was, was special anyway. The first English side to get there, and after the Munich disaster, you know, the script was perfect. Number seven, one man who just needs no identification, George Best, playing his second game at Wembley. A best. And it's a foul, oh, a nasty one by Cruz. Brought down this time by Adolfo. And the crowd being bitterly disappointed at all this. Almost petty fouling, some of it. United have got Ben Vigor on the run now. Sadler, Charlton, a goal! He scored! Charlton has scored! Best. And surely, oh, what a save by Enrique from Sadler. But how wide open the Benfica defence was. Torres, now to Grasa, Sergio Augusto. Torres, and a chance. It's equaliser by Grasa. We could have lost it at the end. And Eusebio had a great chance. And, uh, I suppose, you know, if you give him the same chance 99 times over 100, he'd, he'd maybe stick it away. One against one and he blasted the ball. <laughs> I've got urchin written on me, on me chest, it's mitre backwards, you know, that's how hard he hit it. But uh, it stuck and that was it. That was it. It was pure genius. The way he collected the ball, controlled it, and, and took it up around the goalkeeper, I thought, I don't can I? Did you jump up? Well, yes. <laughs> and that one, yes. <laughs> so the crowd really giving Ben Beaker the stick now as they get right behind Manchester United. And Charlton in the middle, so too is Aston. Charlton! Another! He's got another! Is it all over? No, yes, it is! It's all over! Manchester United have done it! The one thing that will always stick in my mind is seeing the boss running in the field and his face. I mean, I'll never forget, I can still see it today. If you could take a photograph of it, just that one incident 
at one, one split second in time. You see his face. I mean, it was a dream. Everybody wants to shout now. Well done, Bobby Charlton. Well done, Manchester United. If the past had been caught up by Charlton and Busby, the future belonged to Best. The joyride had only just begun, and everybody wanted to climb on board. George's face fitted every label. I did uh, chewing gum. I did one for the egg marketing board. I did an aftershave one. Always the best for Georgie. Four men's grooming aids. Real masculine. Aftershave, hairspray, talc, the lot. Four brings out the best in a man. And of course, I was doing the clothes for uh, great universal stores for the catalogues. So. What was the most embarrassing one you did? Well, looking back, it was the one I did for here, uh, for Ireland, was, was Cookstown Sausages. It takes a lot to get George Best away from football, but one thing always works, his mum's cooking, especially when it's Cookstown Sausages, dependably fresh, dependably delicious. George loves their pure meaty goodness. So do all the family, because Cookstown Sausages make a real big meal. I think I had to hold it up with a fork and say Cookstown are the best family sausages. What the man means is Cookstown are the best family sausages. And I must have done it a hundred times and I think they used the first one that I did. Buy Cookstown sausages. They were trailblazing, hair-raising days. The first footballer with his own personal stylist. I was a hairdresser and I'd opened the hairdressing salon next to George, next to George's boutique. Malcolm used to do my hair, and uh, his dad used to shave me. Of course, the famous story about when I flew back from Spain to, to have Malcolm do my hair. I couldn't find a good barber in Spain, so I came back and let Waggy do it. He'd have it done every day. He'd have his shampoo every day and have it blown in every day to look the part. He was an attractive man and a superstar, so all the girls went with it. We all had a great time. We all went out to restaurants and six or eight of us in a crowd. There was a place called Blinkers, which was uh, our good friend Selwyn Demi uh, owned. I had the club where everybody went. George would be down there, Mike Summerby, all the other footballers, whoever came from out of town would be in there. Uh, and it was a smart club. And we had a dress image. You couldn't enter unless you wore a shirt, tie, and you would always wear this pinkish or whatever T-shirt it was. And I, you know, several of my better customers of the time would say, oh, Selwyn, how shocking of you to allow him dressed looking like that. And of course, I'd just pull it to one side. I said, listen to me. I said, if you could play football like George Best, you can come down here with your swimsuit on. Sundays, we used to go and see Selwyn. He'd invite the girls around and a few of the boys. Would go around. We'd just go around and uh, listen to some music and uh, all the boys would go off either with or without a lady friend, depending on how lucky or unlucky you got. <laughs> how did it work then? Do you have the first pick? No, 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 we just, uh, we took it in turns, I think. <laughs> Mike Summerby succumbed to temptation. There could be only one best man. I was the sensible one the night before. He was the one that absolutely, I mean, I, I did really have to look after him. I had to virtually dress him in the morning and feed him, and I made sure I, I stayed reasonably sober, if that was possible, the night before his wedding. And uh, everything went off uh, pretty well, so we didn't have too many problems. Uh, I didn't lose anything, I didn't mess up with the speech, and I got him there on time. So it, it worked out quite well. He's very much part of our family because of, of the relationship we had together, and plus my wife thinks the world of him anyway. She's probably in love with him. But that particular day, he was just outstanding. Well, now football and the genius that is George Best. Has there ever been a player who combines the courage, the flair, the speed and the finish that George Best brought all together in one match last night? Is this then the finest player in the world today? Kid. Best. Law, Best. Law. Best 
going right into the trouble. Just look at that. Jordan hits the game. And finally, forcing the fullback to get play in the corner. And that big short two out of the Austrians for way went in. But nevertheless, they're applauding him too. But the supporting cast was changing, aging. European Cup semi-finalists again in 69, beaten semi-finalists this time though. Just as we were all starting to enjoy ourselves, came the beginning of the end. Good evening from a packed Old Trafford at Manchester on yet another night of European soccer. With Manchester United, the reigning European champions, taking on the champions of Italy, AC Milan. Kid to Craddon. Law and Best in the middle. There's Best! And the Italians complaining to each other, Cluricini the goalkeeper, bitterly complaining at the defence, and these Italians are very, very brittle at the back. Best. Best again. Brilliant football. Charlton. Yeah! Have you ever seen a scene like that? Manchester United are alive again. That's Kid to Craddon. Yes! It's there! It was there! And the referees let it go. Surely that was over the line. And the referee says no. I thought the ball was over the line to start with from where it was. And it's uh, after the match. You're just seeing it now, aren't you? There, there it is there. And uh, our boys, after the match themselves, were adamant it was over. And they were all adamant it was over, David. Mm. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think about that? Do you think it was over? You can see the I, line. I, well, I, I'm, I'm sure it was over. You can see it there. And it's, it's perfectly plain to see. Mm. Yeah, to this day, uh, you never convinced me that the ball wasn't not just over the line, but well and truly over here. Yeah. And uh, I think we, uh, we felt we should have won it again that year. That probably was our last chance for a long time. You know, a lot of the lads were getting towards the end of their careers and... Uh, uh, it would have been a nice finish for, for quite a few of them. I mean, I was still a young man. If things had worked out, I could have gone on for, you know, for a long time. Matt Busby had already called time on his own era. None of his successes ever quite found the answer to the big question facing them. Do you feel in any way unnerved by the prospect of having to deal with players like Best and so on? Uh, as long as they're not unnerved, I, I won't be unnerved, no. He had this dream opportunity, which was always doomed to failure. The team really didn't go on after 68. He was in charge of people he'd grown up with and played alongside. We were his good friends, you know, people like Bobby. Whoever was going to follow Sir Mad Busby was going to have, have problems, really. I think George felt, really, he was the one that the team was, should have been a bit built around, quite naturally. He was one of the great world players. I don't think George uh, thought that Wilk was the man for the job. Finding a woman for the job proved just as difficult during the halcyon years of George Best. But in the summer of 69 came the striking Viking. A Danish pastry by the name of Eva Haraldstedt arrived on the scene with wedding bells ringing in her ears. I met her on tour in Scandinavia and came to the hotel and asked for an autograph. I mentioned it to one of the press guys and it appeared in the press. I had all sorts of letters from different girls. <laughs> Eventually she wrote and came to stay for a couple of weeks really and um, stayed for quite a while. Yeah, but George has described you as a perfect woman. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think about that? Oh, I don't know. How many people have seen blonde hairs and suddenly thought they were in love and then they suddenly wake up three or four days later and find out they made a mistake? What does your boyfriend think about all this? I don't like it. Do you think he's likely to come over here and take Maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> he fancied her and pulled all the stops out to get her. Would you like to marry him? <laughs> I don't know. There was never any danger of me getting married to her, that's for sure. Do you think if he'd got married and settled down, would it have made a difference? No. No, not at the stage he was at. Because there were numerous girls, some good, some bad, some excellent, who would have made excellent, you know, super wives. 
but wouldn't have changed. You couldn't change George at that point in his life. Every time he got, he was in a romantic situation, I was always hoping and wishing that this could be it, but it wasn't. It wasn't. He liked life and he liked, he liked the ladies. Best. Still best. Oh, magnificent shot by Best against the crossbar. What magnificent skills to produce a shot like that. George Best at his brilliant best. Best off in chase. Can he give Simpson the slip? A shot and a goal! A mistake by Webster. Kid looking for it and getting it. Morgan wanting it on the right. Best in the middle again. McClintock shadowing him. Now Best! Best! It's now by Sadler! Do you think Wolf McGuinness has made a difference to the team? Well, Wolf's young, enthusiastic, and he trains with us. He really makes sure we're there. He's behind us all the time, shouting and screaming. So you feel as if you've got to do it for him. But George uh, was his own man on the field, as was Charlton Law. But George, uh, that, I did actually say that to George. Go and score a goal today, George. Go on. And th 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 what else do you need to say to George Best? George Best. Really always policing him. But a good ball finds Morgan with a lot of room. Willie Morgan. Really getting it away. Gowling there. Best! It's there! Best has equalised! Paul Maidley. Well tackled by Tony Dunn. Finds Alan Gowling. Bobby Charlton, United moving forward again, Manchester there, George Best a lot of room to work, Gibbons on his right, Best again, a glorious goal by Best, what a magnificent goal by Best, a masterpiece of a goal by Best, straight at the ball. Sadler, Get to Morgan, Best, a great goal! George Best got it. It's almost frightening what he can do. And another goal. A great goal. Scored by Kidd, but made by this genius, George Best. Now Burns. Best. Kidd Best. Now Lee, good control by Lee. Was it a penalty or wasn't it? It's a penalty for that foul on Francis Lee, Mr. Taylor, without hesitation, giving the penalty. They got a very bad penalty, which should never have been a penalty. Fran Lee died from the halfway line and ended up in the penalty area. Jack Taylor was the referee, and at the end of the game, George, in disgust, knocked the ball out of his hand as we walked off. Quite natural gesture, I thought, for the, what had happened. And George was given a month suspension. It was referees mostly I got in trouble with for things I said to them because they were, and I, they were there and they still are today, most of them totally useless. It wasn't to be the first unscheduled leave that George would take. Suddenly, the love of his life was becoming a job of work. Well, this last two or three weeks has been murder. I, I don't know what it's gonna be like when I eventually finish. We wouldn't have all that long to find out, but some wanted it sooner rather than later. The press were saying, oh, George Best, Will McGuinness can't pick George Best for this game. I thought, I can, and I will. The press were saying that I shouldn't be brought back into the team because they were doing reasonably well without me. And there's only one way to answer critics, and that's uh, and, uh, put two fingers up and do the business on the field. And that day I did it. Not once or twice or three times or four times or five times, but six times. <laughs> Best going through the middle. And uh, considering it was, uh, I was a bit rusty, they, they got off lightly. Here's Crerand. Best. Here's the record. There it is. George Eves sets a new scoring record for Manchester United. Six goals in a game. That was him, you know. He said, well, I'll, I'll just show you for, for banning me for six weeks. And he, he came back and... Uh, 
And like as I said, score six goals. He could have probably had about eight, eight or nine, but uh, stuff you. That, that was his attitude. Besslar's success in United Colours was in an indoor five-a-side tournament. Only the style remained the same. Best! 1-1, one, one. it's going in! And Best has done it again! Best, four minutes to go, one each. He's got it! What a goal! We won everything else, we might as well win that. It was the first time we'd ever been played, and so we were the first winners of that as well. So we were the first English winners of the European Cup, and that was the first team to do the treble, first team to win the Premiership, and we were the first team to win the five-a-side. So that lap of honour with Bobby Charlton was genuine? <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, you want to win everything. You wasn't tongue in cheek, you meant it. Oh, yeah, we were knackered at the end of it. It was, it was hard work. Best. George Best setting it up for a shot. Here it comes, off the ball! Georgie Best. Making space for his cross and best! Best is up front. There he is, the defence split. Can he do it? He surely must. And the genius that is George Best, it's all still there. George Best was, uh, had some marvellous games for me, and uh, one in particular we played against Chelsea in the quarter-final of the League Cup. I can remember George picking the ball up on the halfway line and then Ron Harris came in and tried to cut him in pieces and uh, George glided past his waist-high tattle. Then he sent Peter Bonetti, the Chelsea goalkeeper, three different ways before pushing it into the empty net. He went down on his knees, his arms were in the air. Every, everybody in the crowd was stood up cheering. But to me, uh, I thought, George, great goal. And if you'd have only gone past nightclubs the way you went past defenders, you'd have still been playing. Playing was no longer the be-all and end-all of George Best's life. The bubbles were going to his head. His headlines were back and front page. I was haunted because I enjoyed life. You know, I did normal things. I, I was in the company of beautiful women. I, I drove fast cars. They were after him. They wanted to find fault wherever they could. And George now and again gave them the opportunity to do that. Maybe United were looking for an opportunity to stand McGuinness down. Busby resumed control before the end of 1970, with George preferring the Chelsea flat of Sinead Cusack to a New Year game against Chelsea. Not for the first time the manager told his prodigal son to settle down and set up home. I'd met this guy called Fraser Crane, who was a, an architect. And then we found this plot of land, and I basically left it to him and he built this most beautiful house, very advanced of its times. The joke amongst us was it, it looked like a, just like a huge, great big toilet. It was tiled. It got the reputation of being looking like a public toilet. The toilet he bought in, in Bramall, I think. Well, oh, it wasn't, it was a house. <laughs> it looked like it was something from outer space, which was a total disaster. The bath was a problem right from the start because the tanks weren't big enough to fill it. It was about two feet deep and filled up to three inches. <laughs> so Mr Crane had a lot to answer for. <laughs> George was still showering English football with moments to remember him by, though. Karen. Collins' is header that was. Comes the best. And it's there. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I was at the game like that, and I was just looking sort of through George's head. And as soon as that ball was coming, I knew it was going, as soon as George leaned back. And I was up on my feet before he hit it. And, and the guy said, how do you know it was going to be a goal? I said, well, I just know the player. <laughs> Corner and a cucumber. It was so deliberate, so beautiful, that it really was one of the gems of the season, the way that Beth played that, with all the assurance that he knew it was going in and that Jennings had no chance. Green off, back for Bernard. The aerial ball skills, well read by Fitzpatrick. Charlton taking over, best breaking, and in a great position to break too. This looks bad. What a great goal, George Best and referee John Gow clapping his hands together and saying, well done too. Morgan, Trevor outside him on the right. Doesn't need to use him. Aston trying to set it up for Best. Oh, yes indeed. How about that fella? Isn't that the most beautiful footballer you've ever seen? It? Oh, 
not such a good one by Paddy Curran, but in fact, uh, Bobby Charlton made something of it. Law lifting himself again. Gowling, Best, and there it is! George Best, 3-2, and Manchester United's comeback is complete. And there you have the United fans with their cheerleader and all. In 1971, United appointed a new keeper of their crown jewel, a fellow Irishman. But that's where the similarities ended. Frank O'Farrell, what are your feelings as you take over this job? I feel optimistic, although in recent seasons the club hasn't had the success it had before that. I feel that inevitably this club will again win honours. How soon, I can't say at the present time, obviously. Frank O'Farrell came with a good reputation. And being Irish as well, I thought it would have been a, a good thing for Man United. I suppose it's a, a new chance for a new manager coming in. I, I, will, I, will try and, uh, I will try and tame him and he will work for me. And, uh, and that didn't work out. Some players thought he was a little bit aloof, which he might have been. He was, he was the headmaster type. And it started off marvellous. I mean, they were top of the league. Uh, right up until I think near Christmas time and then all of a sudden a few bad results and things started to go He's got O'Neill going outside him and three men inside one is Law playing it for Best Best has made room for his left foot Sadler is up there at the near post good back header and Best has given the corner and it's been taken George Best so two dummies and now has made a chance for himself his hat trick <laughs> players are losing this ball in the sun but it was Best who picked up that kid flick driven wide Best was 25, and yet already they had begun to talk about the new George Best. Sammy McElroy was the first, another Belfast boy who made a scoring debut at Main Road. McElroy to Best. The crowd not liking it because they think that he got me booked. Kids cross, O'Neill, Best. He's my hero. Everyone loved him. He was a great footballer and George was one of the first came to me and said, you know, just go out and enjoy yourself. Um, play natural and you'll be all right. And if you score today, I'll give you a bottle of champagne. Um, which he did. On the Monday, he brought a bottle of champagne in for me and I think I kept it for about five or six years without opening it. <laughs> you should have kept it. It might be worth a few quid. <laughs> the long cross, although McElroy now moving to the near post. Best! Charlton. Best! George Best made it look so easy, doing a double shuffle that Muhammad Ali would have been very proud of. There's McElroy again, running out to the right. Get on the far post, best near in! And Steady made it! Gabriel trying to get across, but Steady made it, George Best! But a year on from his disappearance with Sinead Cusack, George legged it with Caroline Moore. The vanishing acts were wearing thin. He has been fined two weeks' salary. He's got a train every afternoon as well as morning this week, and he'll be required to live in lodgings until the end of the season. It was maybe a little bit unfortunate because I was, it was at the time where I'd, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so it was difficult for him. So at a stage where the club were going through all sorts of changes and turmoil, and it had never been that way, you know, because I'd never had problems on the field. And once that started, it, was, it didn't matter who was in charge, really. You know, if you weren't getting the results, it wasn't going to work. George decided he wasn't going to work. There was now another addiction in his compulsive life. I was fed up. It, uh, I, was, I was being hassled by the press. Uh, the great side I'd played for had disappeared virtually overnight. And 
I stopped enjoying it. He went to Spain and was very upset. We had a horde of press after George and everything. He just was very unhappy. He was an, an unhappy young man at that time. There were two um, Arsenal footballers who, who cornered George and begged him not to, not to leave the game because he had so much to offer. One of them even promised they wouldn't kick him if he stayed in the game. It was that kind of a promise. Best he won't kick you. There were times when he, he, you weren't able to get to him or you know, he'd, he'd run away, he'd hide away in London or, or somewhere or go abroad. Um, and really, you, all you wanted to do was help him because he was a mate, he was a pal. We took it as, OK, that's, that's it, because we didn't, we didn't really know much about him. I was shocked, I mean, as I say, but again, I think this must have been building up inside him because United then just form started to dip a little bit and uh, they weren't getting the results. George was saying at the time, well, we should have replaced them. How do you replace a player like Dennis Law? How do you replace a player like Bobby Charlton, Nobby Styles? Tell you something with great, great difficulty. You don't find players don't like that don't just turn up every five minutes. George turned up again. The three musketeers were reunited for a brief farewell tour. Old feelings returned, but the old days were gone. When I said I, I was going to quit, I was. But while I was away, I got so many letters from young kids, you know, and. I, I had a couple of weeks and I just sat down and thought about it all and uh, decided to come back and if the club wanted me back, I decided to come back, train hard and, and get as fit as I could and, and just start enjoying playing football again. He's been directed to um, uh, go to live with Mr and Mrs Paddy Crearand uh, for a time to enable him to get regular habits, uh, which he finds difficult to do, living on his own. He came in on his day for two or three days, but that didn't last too long because <laughs> I mean, don't forget, I've got kids that were getting up for school at half seven in the morning and George didn't fancy that too much. I don't think anyone's entitled to do is tell, tell another person where to live <laughs> or how to live. As long as, you, as long as you're not letting them down on the field. But O'Neill to George Best again. Getting past Robson. Still with Best. Anyone go? And a go! George Best then! Scores his second goal of the season. The first came from a penalty. I hadn't become a bad player, but I was playing with uh, inferior players. All of a sudden, we had people who were going to be saviors. You know, Ian Story Moore came and Ted McDougall came, and they were going to change them. <laughs> it's not quite the same. And that really was the first piece of real George Best we've seen. Then his mind that um, he, he just wasn't ready for it. You know, he, he wanted to see, I think, more better players around him. And um, I think once he came back, as I say, he was in the right frame of mind. And that's a beautiful ball from Best to Morgan. And Morgan's got a real chance here. And he's made it. Number three from Willie Morgan. And the chilling factor, that glorious pass from Best. But the last rights were being read on a team that had fallen almost as far from grace as George himself. Charged with assaulting a waitress in a nightclub, he was now chewing on the final straw. There was a sad inevitability about the concluding scenes to the melodrama. The decision that ends George Best's nine-year career with Manchester United came from a two-hour boardroom meeting attended by all the club's directors and manager Frank O'Farrell. Mr O'Farrell later said that the transfer was for continuous breaches of discipline over not just months, but years. Best had not known that the board meeting was today, but would have known if he turned up for training yesterday. His latest disappearance was out of the blue, and the club had no idea where he was. I was in London uh, on Monday night. I happened to go down into Tramps, and I saw George Best down there. He seemed very dejected. You know, he was a very confused person. Did he say what he was thinking of doing? I said to him, what time are you coming to Manchester tomorrow? And he said, uh, he said I'm, I think I'm thinking of going to New York. So I said, what are you going there for? He said, well, he said, I, know, I can no longer... I feel I can no longer be the player I was. The club tried to beat him to the knockout punch, sacking Best in almost the same breath as O'Farrell. George didn't need telling this time. Do you feel you run away from all the big decisions in your life? Uh, generally, yeah, but I've always said I like travelling, so <laughs> it's always easy, the easiest way. But seriously, I, it would have, probably would have been easier to sit down and talk it out with someone, but I always find it difficult to find someone I could sit and, and explain to properly. How I felt. Sir Matt Busby had a lot to do with George Best's success at Manchester United, the way he was and the way he played and the, 
the way that uh, he knew how to handle him. I think other people that came after that didn't really know how to handle him. Probably was a bit of jealousy or petty jealousy, which there is in, in professional football, not only in the players, but in management as well. Nine months later, another rebirth. Another fast car looking for another fast solution to the problems plaguing both player and club. Neither bore much resemblance to their old selves. Sir Martin, Pat Cairn felt that George could do as a turn, which I did as well because we weren't blessed with great players at the time. We brought him back and it was a disaster actually. He played about three or four matches and he'd just gone. I just felt flat and uh, I'd, never, I'd never felt like that about football ever. And the feel flat playing for Man United was just, uh, it, was a, <laughs> it was a weird situation. George had played a couple of games and it wasn't there, you could see it wasn't there. So you could go to George and speak to him nicely and say, well, it's not going to happen, son. When he came back for that year, it was more, it was more trouble than it was worth, actually. You know, we didn't need that. We had enough problems in the footballing side of the club at the time. Then the crowning blow was a cup tie with Plymouth Argyle when they turned up with his girlfriend and he was uh, in a terrible state, so I just told him to go home. It is not true. I've never, ever, ever taken... When I played at Man United, I'd taken a, a lady to a game. And I've never turned up half an hour before kickoff. As a matter of fact, Paddy Crane was there, and Paddy will tell you the same story. I was here, and Tommy Doc lies about that. Tommy Doc lies to his back teeth about that. And he told me at the time, he said, I'm, I'm leaving you out today. And I remember I, I got so upset. I said, well, if I don't play today, and it was against Plymouth at Old Trafford in the Cup, I said, if I don't play today, I won't play again for you. The lads were shocked as well that day, you know, um, but I think maybe some of them could see it coming, you know, because Tommy Duck was a, a no-nonsense manager. All I remember was, was that, um, you know, we thought George was playing, uh, and when Tommy Duck just uh, announced the team uh, and he wasn't playing, we all knew then, you know, I knew personally that, uh, well, we're not going to see him again. I sat in the stands afterwards for about an hour and left and never went back. It's tragic to think of a player of this tremendous ability, the gift he had, the ability he had. Did you see the change in him come about? Yes, I, I began to see the change because, uh, you see, in the early days he wasn't a drinker anyway. And uh, then I, I could see the, you know, coming and going and that type of thing, that there was something happening which hadn't happened before. Sometime, somewhere, in George Best's groundbreaking Manchester United career, the magic wore off. For him first, then via the public headlines and the public houses, for everyone who had ever thrilled to his boldness and balance, his daring and devil. The unique, complete combination that made up the first football star to rise made his fall all the more vivid and shocking. We're simply at the stage where I'm not drinking. <laughs> Uh, and that's it. Uh, but having said that, it doesn't mean that I won't be drinking tomorrow because no one can can answer that or, or say that. I've had the operation to put uh, the drugs in my stomach, which stopped me drinking anyway. And uh, once they wear off, I have to have them replaced. So it's just a matter of getting through uh, each day at a time, each week and each month. I don't really know what George is going through because I'm not an alcoholic. Um, but I mean, some of the letters I've received from, from people um, who go through this, the same thing, um, they just say how difficult it is. And George said it's difficult. He said every day it's, you know, it's a battle. I know people who've been off it for 20 years and gone back on it, or 30 years and gone back on it. It's, uh, it's basically, it's, unless, <laughs> the only way to stop it is if alcohol didn't exist, but it does. So it's, uh, it's, like, it's like drugs, whether you've been off them for a week or, or 20, 30, 40 years, they're still there. And there's a possibility that you'll put your hand out and take another one. Give us the best bits. The best bits? Best bits of George that we can broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, he's just a really, really nice man. He's a good company, um, very intelligent, um, just nice to be around, nice to be with. When were you happier? When you were dancing with Miss World or when you were putting it through the legs of uh, the poor old Burnley fullback? Oh, football, football. Uh, nothing even came close. Some say his United career was unfulfilled, 
that he robbed himself and the rest of us of his best years, like he owes football somehow. Footballer of the Year, European Footballer of the Year, Championship winner, European Cup winner. George Best was genius, maverick, legend, success. Nobody who ever saw him play will ever forget it. It's football that owes him. Benetti for Chelsea to McCready. Best with McCready and McCready's made a catch and it's a magnificent goal. Best, what a magnificent goal. Perrin forward to Best. Oh, he's going to get number five, yes. Beautiful football by the young outside right, George Best, the boy with the beetle haircut. Oh, how these players can stand this is beyond me. And here come United. It's Best, is he going to get it? Yes! This is fabulous stuff. Down with the free kick. Up goes Best, is Ball. Best has got a goal for Manchester United. Here comes Best again. What a player this boy is. He's got another. What a player. To Best. Look at this for a little bit of acceleration. Ferrand. Burns making a run. Now Heard. Good dummy. Has Best up in front of him. This is Best. Wriggling out space. What a fine set! What a fine shot! Georgie Best! Charlton really battled by Yates. Best trying to break quickly. Doing very well, he's got Laura up there, and he scored! Bobby Charlton, oh, good ball inside the full back to Best. Best off in chase. Can he give Simpson the slip? A shot and a goal! A mistake by Webster! George Best. Greeny always policing him. But a good ball finds Morgan. 
with a lot of room. William Morgan. Really getting it away. Garling there. Best! It's there! Best has equalised! Paul Maidley. Well tackled by Tony Dunn. Finds Alan Garling. Bobby Charlton, United moving forward again, Manchester there, George Best, a lot of room to work, Gibbons on his right, Best again, a glorious goal by Best, what a magnificent goal by Best, a masterpiece of a goal by Best, straight never moved. Sadler, Go to Morgan, Best, a great goal! Number eight, Kidd. Perrin forward for Kidd. In the middle is Morgan and Best. Book could lose it, it's Best! Georgie Best! Good jump then by Dave Sadler. Perrin through for Best. Here he goes again. Georgie Best! What a beautiful bit of running by this man. Best free in the middle. Willie Morgan coming over to help Kidd now. And a chance for Best, here's the hat-trick. There it is eventually. Well, well, well. Georgie Best makes it a hat-trick. Ryan Kidd. Saver then was Brooks. Kidd again. Here's Best. Number four. There's the substitute, Burns. Right in action, right away. Best going through the middle. He's on for five. There it is. It's Crerand. Best. Here's the record. There it is. George Best sets a new scoring record for Manchester United. Six goals in a game. George Best. Morgan, way over on the left side. Faced by Webster. Farland giving him a chase. Best. Durbin's in there. Fitzpatrick. Best now. And there it is. George Best. Making space for his cross and Best. Best is up front. There he is. The defence split. Can he do it? He surely must. Brian Kidd. To George Best. Fitzpatrick. Best going in on it. Best! Oh, beautifully taken by Best! What a magnificent goal by Best! Carlton to take the corner. Oh, another fine save. It's a goal! Best has got it in. He seems to be enjoying life, Mr. Q. Current. Collins is head of that was. Comes the best. And it's there. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Chop taking over. Best breaking. And in a great position to break, too. This looks bad. What a great goal. George Best and referee John Gow clapping his hands together and saying, well done too. Morgan, Crerand outside him on the right. Doesn't need to use him. Aston trying to set it up for Best. Oh, yes, indeed. How about that fella? Isn't that the most beautiful footballer you've ever seen? It? Oh, not such a good one by Paddy Crerand, but in fact, uh, Bobby Charlton made something of it. Law lifting himself again. Gowling, Best, and there it is. George Best. Payne and Best once more bursting on that scene and played there nicely by Perrin for Best. The hammer on and Jackson and he's there. Oh, what a mistake by John Jackson and Best has scored again. Sadler is up there at the near post. Good back in. Taylor's 
header. George Best! has given the corner and it's been taken George Best sold two dummies and now has made a chance for himself his hat trick players are losing this ball in the sun but it was Best who picked up that kid flick driven wide The long cross, although McElroy now moving to the near post. Best! Charlton. Best! George Best made it look so easy, doing a double shuffle that Muhammad Ali would have been very proud of. There's McElroy again, running out to the right. Kid on the far post, best near in. And steady made it. Best. Now Martin Buchan. Good header by Moore for best. to George Best again, getting past Robson, still with Best, letting one go, and a goal! George Best then scores his second goal of the season, the first came from a penalty. George Best to take it, against young Peter Latchford. It's 2-1. George Best makes it 2-1, scoring his third penalty of the season. Best, chance for the shots. Was flicked home by Kidd. Greenoff. West. Nice dummy and shot. Yes. Yeah.